You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Welcome. You are watching, listening to the Financial Survival Network. If you've been watching the precious metals markets, they've not been hit, behaving well since, uh, well, actually four months ago, three months ago, uh, the triple witching hour. Uh, so gold prices go way down, get really hammered. Again, we saw a repeat performance. Now silver is under pressure. And when I want to figure out what the heck is going on with bullion prices, well, it's one thing to read in the paper. It's actually to go talk to somebody who lives and breathes it every minute of the day that he's up. And that's most of the day. A uh, close personal friend, Andy Schechtman, milesfranklin.com. It's the only place that I go to to buy metal. The only place that I really trust. You know, they're licensed and actually accredited by the state of Minnesota, the only bullion dealer to my knowledge to have attained such accreditation. But Andy, uh, Hey, we got the Fed yesterday. We got Powell saying, you know, this inflation thing, uh, it's a little more serious than we thought. You and I, as observers of the monetary policy and the lack of discipline, we have uh, known for months, uh, going back to uh, when the whole uh, global health issue broke out, that inflation was baked in the cake but now all the experts, Andy, are they're shocked about it. They just can't figure it out. I mean, you know, at one point, natural gas is up 150 uh, percent. Natural gas really is the new oil. It's more important than oil. Yes, you fill up your car with gas when you go to the gas station. Um, but natural gas, far more important because it really touches all areas of life, even more than oil because of the conversion, the shift that took place in the global usage from oil to natural gas for a variety of reasons over the past 40 years. I've been alive during those 40 years and witnessed it, but nobody else seems to know anything about anything, Andy. Well, that, that, you know, that's a byproduct, Gary, of, of the lack of reporting from our media. So many of the things that have happened over the last few years that are so relevant from the Basel III reclassification of gold to Saudi Arabia signing a joint military uh, uh, agreement with uh, cooperation agreement with, with um, uh, Russia, Saudi Arabia, with uh, Russia and, and Nigeria. Um, so many of the things that are so vitally important are just not spoken about in the media, even the the new uh, what's hidden inside of the new tax bill. And you have to really, really dig and you have to really, really look they tell just enough, they leave just enough crumbs so that they can say they told us, but the, the lack of honest reporting by the media really is, is very depressing and quite shocking. Let's, let's take uh, piece by piece what you said. You talked about uh, transitory inflation. Now, this has been a joke amongst all of us comment, uh, giving commentary about, about the term transitory. What the hell does transitory even mean? We knew for a fact that it, it was lip service to not freak out the market. So, you know, if you look at what Jerome Powell said yesterday, he said that um, the shift in inflation is not just transitory, but it could be structural. OK, so what does that mean? That means that it isn't transitory and that it is going to be structural, that it is going to continue to increase. In fact, if you look at what um, Charles Evans said, he's the head of, of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. He came out and said that um, the U.S. Central Bank needs to keep monetary policy easy to raise the public's inflation expectations. He said that he did not think that the supply side induced transitory surge in inflation that we are seeing today will be enough to do the trick. In other words, he's saying 
we need more inflation. In fact, he was talking, at least if I can find the actual quote he said, he said, we need a period of sustained monetary policy induced overshooting of 2% inflation to boost long run inflation expectations enough to deliver on our mandated goals. I wonder if these uh, Fed officials take class in mumbo jumbo <laughs> because the way that they speak is, is just so nonsensical. Uh, you almost have to decipher word by word by word and read very slowly. What they're basically saying is they're full of shit and they're going to continue to see inflation. You're going to continue to see quantitative easing. You're going to continue to see $150 billion a month in, in, in uh, treasury purchases. And to the coup de grace, uh, Janet Yellen, the treasury secretary, when she started her testimony, this is how she started it. She said, uh, warning that... Uh, all of the worst parts of the Bible will be occurring if Republicans don't vote to increase the debt, debt limit by uh, October 18th, uh, likely to spur a major financial collapse. So, you know, it's just more of the same, Kerry. You have um, uh, lip service, transitory nonsense. The bottom line is Richard Russell, God rest his soul. Oh. I know you, you used to read Richard and I had the, the, the distinct privilege of meeting him and, and talking with him personally several times. This is a guy that was my mentor. And I'm telling you, 20 years ago, he was saying the Fed has no choice but to inflate or die, inflate or default. And this is the path that they've chosen. We are so far down the rabbit hole right now that if they even attempt austerity, if they even attempt to taper, to normalize their balance sheet, it's game over. And so they won't. They'll continue to inflate. They'll continue to imprint, to print. And you're beginning to see uh, the proof of that, whether it be from Powell or Janet Yellen or the head, Charles Evans, the head of the Chicago Fed. They're all saying the same thing, that transitory, schmanzatory, we're going into structural inflation. It needs to overshoot 2%. You know, the biggest problem with all of this rhetoric and, and them saying that they need to overshoot 2% or whatever they say about inflation is that the measurement that they use, the CPI, is very flawed. And we've talked about this before, too. They're telling us inflation last month was 5.5% on the CPI um, when John Williams of Shadow Stats will tell us it's 13%. So, you know, the bottom line is simply this, that... Um, Inflation will only go higher and they have to continue to print, they have to continue to stimulate. And if they don't, all hell breaks loose. So, yeah, I think that I think that they are using um, when we look at the price of silver, we look at the price of gold. Uh, the the price is not indicative of the rationale to own it or the demand. And uh, it's all it's all about um, uh, shorting, naked shorting on the COMEX market. and. Look, at some point, this has to end because you see massive acquisition on COMEX by big traders, whether it be the managed money, others traders that we've spoken about before, or the commercial banks. Uh, they are literally draining COMEX uh, of, of, their, uh, of the metal right now. In fact, just the other day in gold, uh, 395 gold contracts were posted for delivery just the other day. Uh, multiply that times 100 ounces. It's a lot of gold. And in silver, it wasn't quite as much. Uh, but you're looking at a continual acquisition of metal, uh, taking it off of the exchanges and using these manipulated paper prices to run cover for it. The biggest money in the world is systematically draining COMEX of both gold and silver. The price is nowhere near indicative of the demand carry. Honest to God, it is nowhere even near it. So what do you make of what's happening in China now? With uh, They're basically having an economic meltdown. Uh, it's, of course, you can't count on the media to tell you anything like you said, but the Evergrande thing, uh, they have a $60 trillion real estate market there. And if they don't bail it out, it's going to be in shambles and it'll wind up being a $15 billion market. It'll lose 75% of its value overnight, which will send that country into a massive depression overnight. Uh, so they're going to bail it out. It's just a question of how they're going to do it. They're going to do it while saying they're not doing it, right? Yeah, they'll ring fence it. Look, the Evergrande thing is $300 billion. Their banking system is over $5 trillion. It's not that big of a deal for them to, to contain this. The, the bigger problem uh, of their overextension 
in the real estate market is something that um, uh, I think that they'll probably find a way to to deal with. Uh, I, I really do. I think that um, they're not going to allow this to 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 blow up. Um, but look, you're seeing these kind of problems all across the globe where you have uh, uh, a massive period of time where you see an expansion in credit. And uh, in, in Austrian economics, this is what they call the crack up boom, where everything blows up, where a price discovery is next to impossible. This is the byproduct of a wicked, massive expansion in credit that ultimately leads to some sort of a contraction in credit. Uh, and 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 real price discovery. I don't think Evergrande is going to be the uh, the pin that that bursts their bubble. I really do think, as you said, they'll ring a fence that they won't allow it to create contagion. Um, I, I their their ambitions internally and externally with infrastructure uh, is is quite admirable. I. Um, I don't know how it all plays out. I'm not a Chinese expert as it plays out in terms of their real estate market. And I know that they have a massive, uh, a massive bubble in their real estate market. But um, look, I think the Chinese are on the path to ultimately taking over the reign of, of, of economic powerhouse in the world. I think the, the wealth is moving uh, eastward. Uh, all of the gold is moving eastward. Uh, they are building the, as we've talked about before, the Belt Road Initiative, connecting 75 percent of human population, 45 percent of global GDP. They're using the Chinese digital yuan to do that. Um, in a world of imperfect choices, if I had to choose between the United States economic backdrop versus China, we see uh, a, a, a country that is rich in assets, that is the largest importer and accumulator of gold in the world. They own all of the world's, virtually all of the world's rare earth metals. Um, they're striking relationships across the globe, usurping the dollar. While we sit and talk about uh, wonk social issues, uh, we're, we're fighting over a three and a half trillion dollar infrastructure bill, and we're an insolvent government that is a few days away from shutting off the lights, yet we're trying to figure out how we can borrow three and a half trillion dollars to misappropriate most of it. Most of it won't even go to infrastructure. We'll go to stupid social programs that uh, our eye is not on the ball. So in a world of imperfect choices, I would choose the Chinese plight over ours in that um, they are building relationships and assets that will allow them to, I think, transition whereas the dollar um, is, is mirrored in tremendous amount of debt with no way out, can't let interest rates rise, can't normalize the Fed balance. You'd have to continue to, to print and stimulate a debasing the value of the dollar. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think, I, I think Carrie, that these are going to be, as the Chinese curse says, very interesting times. And I wouldn't bet against the Chinese uh, coming out of this better than the United States does when it's all said and done. I really would not. I think they are in a position to do just that. Well, we will see. Uh, it always uh, appears that your adversary is stronger than you. Uh, but what about the COMEX and this huge whale? What's going on there? It's really very shocking, actually, what's going on there. If uh, we go back, for example, to August 9th, when, when the price of metal just cratered, uh, you know, it, it, when that happened, uh, we talk a lot about um, this group, the others, right? The, I've been mentioning that for over a year. These are the some very, very influential managed money traders that are not commercial banks. I often talk about how when gold uh, gets pushed down, the commercial banks are there to cover as the prices go down. Now, normally you cover short positions when the price goes up. Right. But what the commercial banks do is they engineer the price down so that they can cover their positions at, at no loss. Right. So let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, and then I'll mention this whale, which is really very significant, in my opinion. First of all, when we talk about the August 9th smashdown, gold was sitting and we may have talked about this before, but I would like to bring it up so that I can explain what happened that same time with the others. Uh, gold was sitting on the 200 day moving average, which in in general terms is the uh, delineation between bull trend and bear trend. If you bust through 
the 200 day moving average downward with momentum, that signals a bear trend and conversely up through it with great momentum would signal and technical analysis, a bull trend. So it was right for the picking sitting on the 200 day moving average. And as we talked about in the middle of the night at roughly 4.30 in the morning, after London had closed, before New York had opened, a trader dumped 4 million uh, ounces of gold, excuse me, uh, take that back, uh, 4 million, what was it? Yeah, it was 4 million ounces. It was 4 million ounces of gold. It was, it was 4 million ounces of gold onto the, what was it, 2 million? I don't remember. It was August 9th. It was either two or four million ounces of gold. I think it was billions of dollars worth. Yeah, no, it was billions. It was almost five billion dollars worth. So that'd been two million ounces of gold. So someone dumped two million ounces of gold, whatever the number is. It was an extraordinary large amount. It's been over a month now, so I don't remember exactly the amount, but it was a large amount of gold in the middle of the night, which pushed the price down through the 200 day moving average with a great deal of momentum. And by the time it hit New York, all of the funds that were positioned long had triggered sells, uh, sell orders because it had now violated 200 day. And before all these traders even got into their office, they would have been sold out of their position. When that happened, we talked about the commercial banks immediately covering uh, over the um, the amount of gold that was dumped, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 billion worth of gold contracts were covered at $100 less per ounce. 66 million ounces of silver were covered uh, as silver got down to 22 bucks an ounce. So first and foremost, they pushed the price down. The funds trigger sell orders. They knew that if they pushed it down the hill far enough, the funds would all do their dirty work for them. And sure enough, by the time it hit New York, gold was down 100 bucks. They covered tremendous uh, uh, number of old contracts, all these December contracts. They, co they cover them at, at, you know, no harm, no foul. But when that happened, right, so when they, they um, pulled themselves out of these short positions that were losing money, there was the manage money others group. There's one very large whale that was sitting there waiting to, uh, with open hands, waiting to uh, accumulate. Before I tell you how much, do you remember we talked about the Ever, uh, not Evergrande, uh, what was the name of um, the uh, Palantir, the tech company, yeah. Palantir, yeah. They bought $50 million worth of gold, right? And they're waiting for an economic meltdown. So uh, this one trader actually, so let me just read this to you. Uh, data over the past four reporting weeks, weeks indicate that a large non-commercial trader has amassed as many as 40,000 COMEX gold contracts, the equivalent of 4 million ounces of gold. That's $7.5 billion. In addition to the concentrated long position being amongst the highest on record, even more interesting is the sharp increase began the reporting week corresponding to the recent deliberate smashdown of gold and silver prices into August 9th. What this indicates is that the large non-commercial trader, trader most likely included in the others category uh, bought aggressively into that price smash apparently by design. For the record, nearly 40,000 con uh, contracts of Comex Gold Futures has a total notional value of 7.2 billion and each dollar mo uh, move higher or lower would equate to 4 million in profit or loss to the holder. Uh, margin requirement for that position at $8,250 per gold contract would be $330 million. So first of all, let's let's talk about this for one second. Uh, who's got $330 million to post margin? Uh, who's got the, the ability to, uh, to control $7.2 billion worth of gold? And in relation to Palantir, right? Uh, when the price fell, that trader bought 38,000 contracts. So over the last four weeks, it's jumped up to 40,000. So let's just com compare and contrast and talk about how little the media does to really tell us what's happening. They made a big deal about Palantir and kind of put it in an ugly light that this is they were preparing for some sort of a meltdown, kind of laughed and mocked them. Uh, this one trader, so who's controlling 38,000 contracts at that moment and now 40,000 subsequently, the fact is this, that 38,000 COMEX contracts uh, or 3.8 million ounces is more than 130 times larger than what the Palantir traders bought. So you're talking a massive, massive, massive whale. This is one of the largest concentrated long positions the COMEX has ever seen. 
And what's different about these other traders is that for the past year and a half, they've been standing for delivery. Now, these were December contracts, and they're going to stand for delivery. And so I think that when you see this kind of um, uh, willingness to stand for delivery, um, it, it is certainly, I think, a, a game changer. The commercial banks cannot continue to naked short the price of gold and silver without worrying that uh, these traders are going to stand for delivery. And you know the engineering of the price down, they're certainly trying to shake as many people from the tree as possible. No question about it. But when you see the amount of, of deliveries off of COMEX, not only by this others category, but by the commercial traders as well, it's a, it's a game that's going to end at some point, and it's going to end on a Sunday night. We'll wake up Monday morning to a new reality. Um, I will simply tell you this, whoever has enough money to post $330 million margin and stand for delivery to December, um, it, you're, you're dealing with the wealthiest, most um, connected and and well-informed traders on the planet. So it, it's a big game changer, Carrie, and something people should should feel take comfort in those that, that own precious metals, knowing that when the price is being pushed down, um, the biggest money in the world is looking at it as a gift and they're standing for delivery. Yeah, well, we've seen that for quite a while. So there's some hidden stuff in the tax bill we were talking about. Uh, what is up with that? Don't just survive, thrive. The Financial Survival Network. Arcana Corporation is on the verge of bringing the world's highest grade silver mine into production. The Revenue Virginius Mine in Colorado has proven improbable silver reserves grading nearly 37 ounces per ton silver with an all-in sustaining production cost of only US $8 per ounce of silver. The mine is fully permitted with infrastructure already in place and the company has announced they plan to commence production in 2020. Achieving successful production usually results in a significant upward share price re-rating on the Lasan curve. Arcana trades under the ticker AUN in Toronto and AUNFF in New York. To learn more, go to arcana.com. That's A U R C A N A.com. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. Yeah, I don't know why people aren't out in the streets with pitchforks freaking out. You know, the biggest thing in the tax bill, aside from the increase in taxes, uh, is the proposal to monitor, make a requisite for uh, monitoring of all gross inflows and outflows of money, whether it be through PayPal, Venmo, crypto exchanges, bank accounts, brokerage accounts, anything above or um, above $600 in or out will man be mandated reported to the IRS. Um, this is an erosion of our liberties. It's, a, it's uh, usurping the Fourth Amendment. Uh, and it is, I think, the precursor to a digital currency where people will say, well, what does it matter? They've been following what we've been doing anyway for quite some time. Uh, this is in the tax proposal, literally. It, it's in there where anything that you do from PayPal all the way up to your crypto exchange or your brokerage or your bank, you'll be reported to the IRS in, um, in excess of $600. And uh, so the days of privacy are rapidly coming to an end. Uh, if there are people out there who have been hoarding cash, and I know a lot of people do, um, you know, you put that back into your bank account, they're gonna report it. Um, you try to, to to put money into pay, PayPal or Venmo and, and, and pay things that way, it's going to be reported. There is nowhere to hide. One of the things that has really spurred our business lately, like extraordinarily so, and most of it by mainstream people who have never bought metal before, is legislation. People are very frightened that, you know, even people who have nothing to hide, that, you know, our, our privacy is, is literally being stripped from us as we speak. So, I don't understand why people aren't in an uproar about this, where um, we have to be monitored as as a as a free yeah. uh, society. Uh, and once you give up your freedoms, you never get them back ever, ever, ever. So this is just the very beginning. And this is another reason to hold precious metals, which is an exit, if you will, from the matrix, it gives you some sort of uh, privacy in a world where privacy is rapidly dissipating. Yes, it does. So it's rather shocking. Can't even believe it myself that we're living through all this. Hey, one other thing before we conclude, uh, what's doing with premiums on gold and silver? I assume they're going higher. Uh, I believe they will go markedly higher. Um, 
the they've come down over the last few months to maybe the lowest level we've seen since uh, February 2020. Uh, but what we are also seeing is a um, all of the mints are going on rationing and and on intermittent allocations. They are not uh, coming out with weekly. Uh, allocations anymore. It's bi-weekly or monthly, all of them. And so what we are basically being told is that when we sell out of the product, we have two to four weeks on, on any new product that we order. That is the precursor to much higher premiums where uh, this is again, what I'm talking about where the price does not dictate or is not a reflection rather of the demand. We sold carry honest to God last week, 600,000 ounces of silver in one week. Now, in my wildest imagination, I would have told you that'll never happen. Um, we're getting phone calls where people are saying, I want $5 million worth of silver, and I've never talked to these people before on a first time transaction. You know, you're talking 200,000 ounces of silver, and they want to take possession of it. I mean, these, these are, um, and this was just one call. The next day, he called and placed a million dollar order for his church. These are the kinds of things that I have never seen in 31 years. So, when I tell you that price is a tool of misdirection, honest to God, it truly is, especially for the big money. The big money who is trying to accumulate gold and silver uses price not only as a tool of misdirection to corner the market, but it is this volatility, it is this um, misdirection or counterintuitive uh, direction or mentality that has allowed the dollar to remain world reserve currency probably longer than it should have. But as we've talked about before, when you see Saudi Arabia signing a joint military cooperation agreement with Russia the day after the debacle in, in Afghanistan, the next day Russia doing it with Saudi Arabia, I mean, with um, Nigeria, the two biggest OPEC producing countries in the world, I will tell you in the back of my mind, no matter how hard I try to think it away, I believe the days of the dollar as singular world reserve currency are coming to an end. Uh, the chess pieces are being put into place to do that. And when you talk about all of the reasons to buy precious metals, uh, big money for the very first time is waking up to it. Big money that has never called us to buy metal before. They are beginning to, uh, even those that have done exceedingly well in equities, are beginning to see the um, the illusion uh, that that this really appears to be. And they're looking for some semblance of safety and think about it. When this gentleman spent $5 million with me, we had a very long conversation hours. And uh, I said to him, I said, Billy, if I put a $20 million bill in your pocket, this is a guy who sold his company for almost $200 million. And I said, if I put a $20 million bill in your pocket, Billy, where would you put it? Would you put it in stocks at all time highs uh, with uh, price to earnings ratios off the chart, paying nothing in the form of cumulatively of a dividend yield? Would you put it into bonds at the end of a 25-year bull market where interest rates are the lowest they've ever been by and large in human history? Would you put it into real estate where values are blown through the roof with low interest rates? You know, the common thread here is if interest rates rise, all three of those markets collapse. Where would you put your money? Put it in a bank account where FDIC limit and bail-ins uh, would make that a foolhardy choice or into a money market where gating legislations are put in at the same time where you can't get out. Where do you put your money? And he said, I put it in gold and silver. And I say that to you because I think about it all the time. Where would you put your money now where you can guarantee any semblance of safety, uh, of privacy, of potential return, and an asset class that isn't at all time highs like everything else? And so big money is waking up to this. Big money is beginning to dip their toe in the water. And this is what overnight will make product availability disappear. Premiums go sky high. And I will say this, and God is my witness, I mean it, if you are not proactive, if you are thinking lately about mitigating your exposure to the dollar in the US markets, if you aren't proactive about this, it will trigger on, on, on a dime. Something is gonna flip the switch where you're gonna see a massive run into the marketplace because of the economic backdrop. And when that happens, the biggest problem people will face will be an inability to quickly source any product at all at any reasonable price. And, and that I do believe because we're seeing such a massive escalation and, and increase in order size um, that it's becoming really incredibly challenging once again to get product. And once again, you will see by the next time you and I talk, 
if it's next month, I will guarantee you will see higher premiums across the board. I don't doubt it. I mean, uh, you guys got to make money here. Everybody's got to make money. And uh, if the uh, product uh, becomes scarce, hey, look at the supply chain here. We haven't even talked about this. You know, uh, the idea of the supply chain, what's happening there. There's shortages of everything, goods that, are, that you would normally think uh, no problem to buy. Uh, it's, it's getting harder and harder to find it. Of course it is. And you have more money uh, chasing fewer goods. And that's classic definition of, of price inflation. And I think you will begin to see that um, uh, express itself even more when you have the Fed talking about moving from transitory to structural inflation. Look, the bottom line is, is that if they do not continue to pump money into the system, uh, the whole thing collapses. It's like a, a giant balloon with a little hole in it. And as long as you have air going into it faster than it's coming out, the balloon stays inflated. The minute you stop pumping that air into it like that, the whole thing just starts to deflate. And then you get massive deflation, um, uh, which, you know, is what the Fed is fighting. And whether we get hyperinflation or the greatest depression of all time, or I think the middle ground between the two is stagflation, perhaps hyper stagflation, which is higher prices, little or no economic growth. You know, we talk about gold and silver being uh, a safeguard against inflation, but actually they perform best in a deflationary period because counterparty risk becomes enormous and um, the ability to perform, if you will. And so as Doug Casey, the line that he's made famous uh, in my mind, uh, gold and silver are the really two of the only assets in the world that are not simultaneously someone else's liability. And when you talk about counterparty risk and liability in a massive deflating environment, that becomes a big problem. And when you add the Fed uh, reaction to that deflation, that being massive money printing and, and inflationary policy, which they're telling you they're not going to stop, uh, it, it just makes it a very painful situation where you're talking about uh, uh, supply chain distortions, higher prices. You can't find the stuff on the shelf. Uh, you try to buy furniture at six, eight months out or longer. Um, anything that you're trying to buy that used to be easy is not anymore. I play golf down here in Florida with a guy who owns a Chevy dealership. They normally have 350 cars on the market. They have on, on the lot, they have 30. Yeah. Uh, Corvettes are selling for $25,000 over sticker, the 2021. So uh, you tell me, uh, how does this end? It doesn't. It doesn't end in a pretty fashion. So whether we see inflation, deflation, the result is going to be the same. You're going to see the Fed continue to print as their only option to keep interest rates low as their only option. And all that will do is further destroy the value of the dollar. It's like a heroin junkie. Either you continue to give him heroin and he he dies slowly, uh, or you pull the needle away and watch him die all at once. And so either way, uh, I think we're in, in a very scary position where I want people to understand you do not buy gold and silver to get wealthy. Uh, it, it is wealth and it is immutable wealth that has lived through two world wars, German hyperinflation, Great Depression and every pandemic. It will be uh, a life raft in, a, in, a, in an ocean of uncertainty. And you can see on the COMEX that the biggest traders in the world agree with this. So they have been draining the metal off the market for the past 18 months. Absolutely. Well, hey, so now's your time. Get the gold while you still can. We've been sounding this alarm for a while. Maybe you think it's the boy who cried wolf, but uh, you know what? Eventually the boy was right and then nobody listened to him. So don't let that happen to you. Go over to milesfranklin.com. Andy, just tell people how they uh, how they do business with you. Yeah, so we are building a new website, Carrie, that will allow a modicum of online purchasing. In the meantime, we're old school. You just give us a call, send an email to info at Miles Franklin. If you mention the, the Financial Survival Network, I will personally guarantee that you get the best price in America. Um, we are currently offering a special right now on the 2021 uh, Austrian Vienna Philharmonic at $3.65 over uh, any quantity. Um, as an example of the kind of prices that we can offer, our prices will never be undersold. 
um, send us an email at info at Miles Franklin, and I will personally make sure that uh, anyone who mentions Financial Survival Network will get the very best price in America and personal attention either by myself or one of a handful of brokers that I have personally trained. All right, we appreciate that. Questions, comments for Andy, just shoot me an email, kl at kerryletz.com. Andy, always a pleasure. Thanks for stopping by. Kerry, I don't mean to be the, the purveyor of doom and gloom, but I think it's time people wake up. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think we are running out of time to protect ourselves. And I'll just say it one last time. The biggest money in the world has been doing this copiously for the last 18 months, and they are using the manipulated price to run cover. I do feel like the little boy who cries wolf. I do. But do remember, as you said, at the end of the story, the wolf comes. And I hope to God for the sake of my children uh, that I'm wrong. But everything in my soul is telling me that, that I'm not. And it's time to hunker down and prepare for some rocky roads. So anyways, you take care, right. Carrie. I look forward to chatting with you soon. Okay, of course, Andy, you be well. Talk to you soon. Thanks. You bet. Thanks for listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.